my name is Kimberly Henriksen, and I am the executive director at the Center for Contemporary Printmaking in Norwalk, Connecticut. Um, this evening's talk uh, is a talk with two of the six artists who are um, in the exhibition that is currently on view called Comfort Discomfort. It's our fall show. It opens September 12th and it will run through October 24th. Um, and while we cannot be there tonight to do a Zoom session with everyone, um, you know, I do highly encourage you if you are in the area or the region, um, we'd love to have you come by and see the show before it closes. Um, so we have two of the artists, Nathan Catlin and Dasha Shishkin. And yeah, so they are here. Hello, hello. Um, I'd like to give a chance um, for each of them to have a bio read so that everybody has an idea of like their background and where they are um, and some of the, the highlights from their, their career thus far before we hear from them. So if you'll bear with me, I would like to um, give you a bit of an introduction to Nathan. So Nathan Catlin is a mixed media artist and master printer at the Leroy Neiman Center for Print Studies at Columbia University. He lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. A mixed race, first generation Asian American from Southern California, Catlin is interested in the complex narratives that arise from distinctions, culture, views on morality, etc., that bring people together and separate them. His work is representational and figurative, featuring human interactions that draw inspiration from classical paintings, comic books, and tattoos. Catlin received his BFA in printmaking from the San Francisco Art Institute in 2007 and his MFA from Columbia University in 2012. His work has been shown nationally and internationally and is represented by Davidson Gallery in New York City. He works in multiple mediums, including printmaking, painting, ceramics, stained glass, and mosaic. So we'll move on and give you a bit of information about Dasha. So Dasha was born in Russia and she lives and works now in New York City, teaching at Pratt Institute. Her work has appeared in solo and group exhibitions in the United States and abroad at institutions such as the Museum of Modern Art PS1 in New York, the Kunsthalle Hamburg and Saatchi Gallery in London. Her work is included in the public collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, LACMA, the Art Institute of Chicago, Dallas Museum of Art, the Pinakothek der Moderne in Munich, Hamburger Kunsthalle, and is represented by Fieldmetter Gallery in Los Angeles and Nancy Littlejohn Fine Art in Houston. Um, I will also say um, I had found a, an article um, from the February 2014 issue of Art in Print um, talking about Dasha's work and um, some of the, the conversation or the, the description around her work had talked about it having a fast stream of visual thought, um, not exactly automatic, but without a pre-planned narrative. And I think you'll find as we go through tonight and look at some of the work um, by Dasha, um, that will, that will come to, to pass as you see the prints. Um, what we're going to do is start with Nathan first and then Dasha, and then have a, a bit of conversation about their work and their process. Um, but before we do get to that, um, I, I put together five slides in a PowerPoint and apologies for a PowerPoint. I know they're not the most fun things, but I wanted to give everybody a chance to see the work up in the gallery. Um, since we're not in the gallery right now for the talk, but should just give you an idea for sense of scale um, and how it fits within the show. So if you'll bear with me, I'll open up my PowerPoint and we will go to here, which will begin with the entry to the, the gallery at CCP. Um, so on the title wall is actually one of Nathan's pieces. And then on the right across from the reception desk is a rather large one of Dasha's. Uh, moving into the gallery, we have some work by some of the other artists. And then there's a, a series of nine prints um, called uh, what is it, the Nine Pickles or the Pickles series on the right. Um, moving around, uh, 
Nathan's work is on the far wall under the window and on the opposite side of that, we can see some of Dasha's prints on the triangular wall on the left. They're, they're smaller in scale. And then pulling back on the opposite side, um, some of Nathan's prints on the left and the Pickles series and one of Dasha's on the right. So this is the smaller grouping that is on that, that triangular piece. So um, beginning with this first print of Nathan's, this is the one that's on the title wall. And I actually put it there because I liked the fact that it was in the first person. It's one of the very few prints in the show that I think you really get that sense of first person perspective. Um, because I, I really appreciated the idea of his work telling stories about the human condition and this experience going through the show of having prints and having an experience that pushes and pulls you between comfort and discomfort. And I saw this print as a work that welcomes you in and carries you um, through this experience that you would have at the gallery. Um, not that Nathan necessarily created this print with that in mind, but um, it, it actually, I thought it fit really well. So Nathan, if you'd like to um, you know, go through some of the prints here with me, and if there's anything you'd like to share, that would be fantastic. All right, hello. Um, yeah, thank you for having us, and thank you for uh, doing this tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you for putting it on the show, actually, too. I mean, it's, it's been a, it's, it was great to see. I went, I went to go see it on the opening day, and it was, uh, space is wonderful, so. Anyway, uh, so the work itself, uh, so all of these works I think were made in the last year, um, or year and a half, sorry, since I think actually uh, after when COVID first hit, um, since we were spending so much time at home, um, that's when I was making most of these works. And so my typical work actually deals usually in long, term, long form narratives. So typically like I'll do, a set of prints and paintings and stained glass, they all kind of work together and they all like work in a, a singular narrative. So in the last three or in the last 10 years, I've probably done about three narratives. So they're, they're very long and, you know, the different aspects of a story. But I think after when COVID hit and you spent so much time um, alone, I started making these works kind of like um, not, not with a narrative really in mind, but more out of this idea that I now have this time at home um, and I'm still working, you know, we're working from home, but, but you can't leave. So, or at least I wasn't leaving. So I was spending a lot of time. And so I started just making these works and I, I started to notice that um, as I was making the works, typically there would, my works have like a few characters in them, like two or three characters that are usually interacting in some way, kind of creating a story or creating some kind of interaction. Um, I started making a lot of, works that were based off of a singular character or singular um, point of view. And so um, a lot of the works I make also are life size or bigger. And I typically do a lot of this thing like with this print where it's you're, you're, you become part of the scene. And I do this with, the, with other prints and other paintings. Uh, where necess where a lot of the characters will have their back to you, kind of referencing that you are part of an audience that is also watching a scene. So that's where that that perspective comes from. Um, this is actually uh, a lot of my work. I, I, I take from um, photographs, and this is actually a, actually from a photograph of uh, kayaking, or maybe I was canoeing. It was canoe um, through some reads actually so it's kind of pretty straightforward but but what it is is I, I take that that idea and then I kind of like build a narrative around it so like even though it's for the most part what was happening you know I didn't have a bucket full of fish with me I just kind of threw that in there um, and I kind of like throw these other elements in order to create narratives but it was a lot about being alone in this space and just kind of like getting lost in this void and I actually did run into these reads and got stuck and it's like well it's photo time and so I moved on from there but um yeah a lot of a lot of the works in the show are about solitude uh we'll go to the next one 
Well, it's interesting you you um, talk about your process and working from photographs because of all things, um, the next print that happens to be in order here in the slides, squeeze. When I was looking at um, the works in the show to to do a write up, um, you know, we've been sending out little snippets on social media and and pulling a couple of prints from each person. Um, this one without even knowing that I thought it looked most like a photograph, like this oddly cropped moment that was captured, not meant to be perfect, but like on the fly caught this area in a, a square. Um, and it felt like I was, I was watching a couple or watching family members or something. So didn't, yeah. didn't realize that that was so spot on. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'll, I think they're all, because I, I usually source my material through old photographs that I've taken, or, or I mean, this was actually a photograph taken of me um, saying goodbye to some, saying goodbye to a friend. Um, and so, but I mean, like, this is like very COVID y in that horrible way um, of what I think a lot of people were experiencing at the time was this lack of um, kind of any kind of intimacy of just like, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a handshaker for the most part. I, I do hugs also, <laughs> but like, there's always at least some like mo moment of contact. Um, and so, yeah, I think during that time, like a lot, like, you know, I wasn't planning, like none of these were, I think as I just started making things, like it started to like click in my head. I wasn't really, really paying attention to what I was making. I was doing a lot more just like, oh, like this is an image and this is kind of like a way that I want to work and I'll crop it and make it interesting for myself. Um, but I think that was where I was coming from was just the desire to just like give someone a hug again because, you know, sitting on your couch by yourself is not, you know, it's, it's just not the most fun thing to do. I mean, sometimes it's great, but you know, sometimes it's not. Yeah, but, but that's where in, in looking through your work to select pieces for the exhibition, um, these moments that you've that you've frozen here for us are those moments that now give us this tension between, you know, a level of comfort and and discomfort. Like we recognize an activity or an action that we used to do so readily. Well, some of us used to do so readily, um, but now we have to reconsider our interactions with people. Like our physical interactions are even close proximity to people in different ways. And so in looking at um, an image like this, um, I'm now doing a mental calculation of, oh, do they, do they live in the same household? Are they in a similar pod? Like how, how close have they been? Are, you know, are they vaccinated? Are they not vaccinated? And these are questions that would never have been part of my, my mindset, you know, a year and a half ago. And yeah, it's just different now. Yeah. I mean, I do think, yeah. I mean, going with the comfort discomfort, I mean, it's, it's that desire for comfort and then the discomfort that comes, I think, from a lot. I mean, people talk about watching TV shows and seeing people, you know, in crowded rooms without masks and how weird that is. And just like the way our brains have been trained in this way, um, you know, at the moment, which is good. And so, I mean, the, even this this image was um, blown up and, and put as a mural um, I think a year ago. So in January or February, so not a year ago, but whatever, at a, at a museum in, um, in North Carolina. And I was just like, it's just perfect for me at the time. Cause it was just like, it's the thing, like the museum wasn't even open. It was like on the outside of the museum. And it was like, you can go in. And it was just one of these things where it's like, that wouldn't that be nice if you could just give someone a hug, but. That wistful thinking, wishful, yeah. wish, wistful and wishful at the same time. Yes. Was kind of, so, I, I had in my head like paired that one with this one because it's it's almost like this is the moment where you do that reflection. Um, I mean, this figure or, or the narrative in that could be very different from what you had intended, but um, in the context of the exhibition, it, it, it for me it provided that sort of that step after to to contemplate what you were looking at at another time happening. So. Yeah. 
yeah, I mean, this one might be a little over dramatic in terms of like what's happening, but it was also the feeling at the time. And so I started making all of these works and um, typically for the most part over the last 10 years, all the works have taken place outdoors. And I suddenly started making these interiors, which is something I don't usually do. And I was kind of like, oh, whatever. And I, you know, but all the interiors had windows. And I realized like where I'm sitting and where I'm sitting now is where I sat for the majority of my time when COVID first came out or first was coming and happening really aggressively. Um, and there's a window in front of me and I'm looking out into the back yards of the buildings. And so I was spending my time at this desk staring at a window and I was doing that for you know a good eight hours a day 10 hours a day um and so I you know I think part of me was just like drawing what I was seeing at the moment when I think lack of inspiration was actually at the height because there was I mean it, you know it's like what do you make right now when it doesn't seem like when I mean the art world was kind of crashing which was kind of amazing but um you know like what do you make at this moment when nothing else when all of this seems so, you know, pointless. I don't know. I mean, but that was, you know, that was the feeling. And then I was just thinking about, yeah, like the way probably people were going through old photographs and thinking about, you know, all the all the times they've had, or, I mean, it's it's a little, like I said, a little dramatic, but it's, it's also, I thought it was something that I was kind of going through, especially when I'm going through, looking through my photos, um, trying to find inspiration you know, you, you just find all these old things and like old friendships and old things like that. And you're like, oh, you know, and um, yeah. And this is actually a photo of um, somebody I was working with at the time, um, kind of looking over her shoulder because we were, we were working on a project together. And, um, and she, you know, it was like, what would someone, have? I mean, everything I put has to make sense to me. Like there has to be like a, a reasoning for it so she has the photos and then there's the photo book next to her that has the corners that hold the photo books in which have the bent corners on the photo which then also would have the tea because they like to she likes to drink tea and then you know I make mean, everything has like this weird thing but um yeah I mean that was it was just pretty much like this having like a nostalgic moment for the past or for you know and also with because of COVID stuff like I mean it, I, I think you were um able to use a lot of these moments that we found ourselves in um you know these quiet times when you know we're we're trying to to do something different than we had been and we found well maybe some people found more than others but available time to you know read or whether it was big bread or um, yeah. to, to dig into an art making practice that, you know, maybe some people hadn't visited in a while or, you know, took up something new. Um, you know, cause there, there were certainly a, a number of people, um, you know, taking online classes and such because they were available and, and you could, could do things maybe that you, you wouldn't have had the availability to do or the accessibility to do. So yeah very true i mean i was teaching online all the time and it was kind of it was kind of i mean it wasn't ideal but it was also nice and it was nice to have like people that maybe couldn't make it out or people from different parts of the country stuff like that so it was interesting that we can now have conversations the idea that you know you can teach a class completely online with people from all over the world i think it's like it was a, it was there but it was never like really looked at and because we were forced into it. It was nice. I got to meet a lot of nice people. So, um, but anyway, and, and then this one was more like, it's supposed to be more, uh, for me, a little tongue in cheek. It's, this is much my brother and it's from a photograph of us. We went be, a year before, maybe two years, actually, I don't remember. We went to, uh, what is it? Uh, not Bruges, but anyway, around there. <laughs> around around that area and it was like this beautiful old city and everything was great and he's very much a homebody or he so I wanted to look around and he just wanted to stop and have a glass of tea and read a book or a cup of tea and read a book which I thought was hilarious because I was like we are in this other country it's very beautiful out there's people everywhere and you're actually outdoors and you just want to sit down so, I, so we made a, a deal he only likes to sit inside because we are very different people so I said hey we can sit 
if we as long as we can sit outside and I can look at things because what am I doing here? Um, well, you can have your tea and I'll just I'll have a drink and watch people. So anyway, so he faced the building. <laughs> so oh. he couldn't, they couldn't see anything because it didn't matter to him, you know. And I faced the outside so I could see the world. So I I just thought this was a funny image when I found it, and I was like, yeah, this is my brother. It's kind of like this really this idea I mean he's reading this book and in the book is actually exactly what's happening outside but he's would rather be in the book than turn around which is fair everyone has their own thing and then on the bottom on the book cover is this painting that I saw um somewhere else and it was a painting of two brothers or two two soldiers I I, I turned them into brothers mentally but like killing each other at the same time <laughs> I just thought it'd be a funny painting to make of my brother and I like killing each other but not like really murdering each other we love each other but um so I thought I'd put that on the cover you're representing that tension between you two yeah but it nothing was wrong it was just like a funny thing and so you know I I made this and it was more of a same thing like the whole world is happening and like I said once again I made this while staring out the window right in front of me and um and it was like for me the desire to be outside and for him I was like there are some people who you know when COVID first hit and as it was going and we're stuck inside, we're very content with that. And he was one of these people. He was like, eh, I get to be inside. I get to read my books. I'm like, all right. It's like that Twilight Zone episode, except uh, he still had his glasses. So, you know. Well, um, I mean, following from that is, you know, the, the cell phone print. Yeah, this was, and this is from a photo that I took right before, I mean, a, a little before COVID hit, and it was a friend of mine, um, just like, she took a photo of me, so that was really funny, so I took a photo of her, and, but she was just so intense on her phone, and I was just, I, when, when COVID hit, I think in the beginning, it's, it's gonna sound strange, but I'm not sure, but, but, like, when at first, I, my hand was, my hand was cramping up a lot, and I was like, what, like, I thought, like, I had carpal tunnel or something like that, and I realized it was because I was on my, I was holding my phone all day. <laughs> you know, I was like, I, I was like, oh my God, I have phone hand. This is insane. Like my hand hurts and that doesn't make any, and I, I, I was like constantly doing this and I was like, what am I, what's happening? Cause it didn't really register to me. I mean, I, I realized, you know, when, um, uh, Facebook and Instagram or all these things went down the other day, like, I didn't even know about it because I wasn't on my phone. <laughs> like, I was like, oh shit, I actually don't use my phone as much as I assume that I do, but I don't. So I guess when COVID hit, I was like, oh, like Instagram all day, that's what people do. And my hands hurt. So I was just like this idea that that's where we all were at that moment. Everyone was just attached to their devices. I mean, not even looking for information necessarily. I was like watching the news every morning. I was watching the Cuomo, de Blasio, and then watching uh, uh, Jersey and then watching Pennsylvania. And I was like, what's happening but I think for most people they're just trying to look for a distraction and that's kind of like where this was coming from just this idea like anything to get me I mean it was like yeah cell phones were amazing or, or if you had a smartphone or if you had the internet access you know a lot of people didn't but if you did it really was kind of a lifesaver it was also the darkest hole you could ever go into and that's where we wind up where we are but you know sometimes the internet's the best thing in the world and sometimes it's the absolute worst but I think at that time it was a good outlet so Sure, sure. Um, and then the the final print that's in here is um, the bathroom haircuts, which was, you know, cer certainly prevalent. Yeah, I think that was just the thing that was like, it was all over. I mean, I feel like, um, yeah, so what happened was a, a couple of friends of mine were moving, as you would during a pandemic, and they had to move into my house, and it was a little you know, you're like, oh, we're friends, but are we okay? Like everyone has to get tested and do all this stuff. This is like, you know, no vaccine yet. And so they moved in, but while they were here, they're like, well, it's been two or three months. No one's had his haircut. I had the, I had a really bad mullet, which I guess everyone did. I mean, it seemed like everyone I was talking to was like, yeah, I got a mullet too. And I was like, oh, we all just, cause there's no one to cut the back of our hair. So we just, <laughs> just shave the sides and we're like, oh, that's what it is. Um, and so it was just like a definite like moment. I think there was like every, not everyone, but a good majority of people could relate to this idea of like the at, at home haircut. And I actually haven't been back to a barber since I feel bad, you know, like they need to make some money, but, um, but no, I just cut my hair for now. And that's why I have like a little bit of bad hair in the back, but, um, yeah. And these are just, these are my friends in my bathtub, 
you know, and she's cutting his hair. And it was, it's also this, like this kind of, for me, like a, like an affectionate moment, you know, like the, the intimacy that we actually are having in these weird ways. And once again, there's like a little window in the background because I couldn't help put a little, I mean, I do have a window in my bathroom. I'm very blessed. Um, so, yeah. Yes, in New York City, that, that is yeah, yeah. a unique thing. In you know, very places. blessed. Yeah. Um, so uh, before we move on to Dasha's prints, um, there is a question here already for Nathan, and um, it's asking if you could discuss more about the long narratives that you've been doing and how the new works fit into those. Do yeah. they, or, or are these discrete things mm -hmm. with kind of a, a broader? I think these don't fit into the old narratives, but they do, I mean, okay, so they, these, I think these actually kind of fit into their own narrative. Like they're their own story now. They're like, they're like, 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 like I don't want to be like COVID stuff because I feel like that's just like so, eh. but like, they're like the more in city, indoor, uh, uh, you know, connection pieces or disconnection pieces, however it is. But I do think that like, um, they relate in terms of the way uh, with my other works, it's, they're all about the way people treat each other or the way people handle each other, how they handle situations, um, how people connect or, or disconnect with each other. And so all of my old works, these long narratives would be about that. There would be like an action moment and then a rep uh, repercussions and uh, you know conclusions. There'd be like this whole these arcs and narrative. And I don't think this necessarily has that, but what it does have is, you know, like with this, it, it's still dealing with the way people deal with each other, with the way the hug, it's maybe more on the compassionate level than some of the other works that are typically like lean a little bit more towards the like deceitful, violent ones, because like sometimes it just seems like the world is burning and we're just kind of like along for this big fire. And then, so because the world had a pause, um, you know, now it's back to on fire, which is wonderful. But, you know, like where there's pause, like it really was a moment where like, it was just like, you, you really connected with your friends again, even through the internet, or you had to have spend time with yourself, which is good or bad, you know, it depends how you're dealing with yourself. And so I, I think like these still dealt with the, the human interaction, even if it's with yourself, but it's dealing with like intimacy and things like that. So I would say that, that they are their own narrative. They fit into like the, what I'm interested in, but not, they don't, it doesn't go with those narratives. Yeah. Right. Thank right. you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. So the next grouping of images um, and, and piece of this will be to walk through Dasha's prints that are in the show. And prior to the, the, uh, start of this talk, I had uh, talked with Do Dasha and uh, Nathan beforehand, and for me, their work is very different, like very different in medium, in um, representation, in where they come to the images that you see. Um, their their source material is very, very, very different in in origin, um, but the work sits very nicely together in the exhibition because of this theme of comfort and discomfort. Um, in that as you walk through, you're, you're regarding each piece in such a way where you're, you're kind of confronting and challenged by like, what are these things I'm seeing? Like, how comfortable am I with that? Why, why am I uncomfortable with that? And sometimes it's because of these interpersonal relationships and narratives that we're seeing in Nathan's prints. Um, and in other cases, um, you know, it's because of the, the content in the other prints, it's just, you know, really un uncomfortable on its own. Um, so Dasha's prints, interestingly, are, I think some of them are like definitely older than many of the other prints that are in the exhibition. I wasn't necessarily making the show, like Nathan, as you said, like not about COVID. It wasn't about COVID itself. It was about this moment in time that we are all living through and, and have lived through in the last um, year and a half or more. Um, and just this like interrelationship challenge that we've got now. And I did not want to exclusively look for work that was from 2020 or 2021 um, because our lives did not begin in 2020 and 2021. 
we have to go back to the same people, the same businesses, the same shops or you know, healthcare providers, whatever they are that we've been going to for years. Um, and like looking at work that is from another time, like you, you come to it in a different way. And so you have this moment of like pause or change in something that you might've seen before when you revisit it in a new moment. Um, so I was not necessarily set on making all the work in the show from, you know, the last year and a half. So don't be surprised as you see the, the prints that come through. Some of them are newer, some of them are older, um, but that, that is not unintentional. So, um, so this first print from Dasha is Hideous Potato, Miss Terribly with Likes and No Hate. This is the print that is on the wall when you first come into the reception area on the right. Um, you can see that it is not a rectangle uh, there on the slide. It looks like a rectangle, but it is not, and it is framed as such. Um, but it is, and, and Dasha, you can actually tell more about this, but it's nine different prints kind of puzzled together, and they are also not at right angles. They are, they are different pieces printed independently. Um, but it's a, it's a good start, I think, to walking into the exhibition to have Dosh's print and to have Nathan's print and to see these two very different, very big, very, um, you know, conscious raising pieces. Um, this one gives you that stream of visual thought without a, a narrative that you can dig into. So that compared to Nathan's work, which has this intentional narrative, Dosh's do not. Um, so Dosh, if you would like to share a bit about your your prints here uh good evening everybody thank you so much uh for coming but also it's such an honor and pleasure kimberly for being invited not to be an exhibition alone but also to be given an opportunity to discuss um the work in the show with uh, yourself and especially with nathan it's uh, whose work i greatly admire and it's sort of amazing to be together on the same platform and um, to some extent, I think, uh, as I was listening to Nathan uh, so intently, the, the idea of this sort of, um, just like you mentioned, because the work is dating from uh, you know, over 10 years, 15 years back now, um, to some extent that vicarious life that takes place in the visual image, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the picture, uh, whether one is doing it consciously or in some ways kind of like loosely creating a bunch of lines. I think it's very uh, connect. I, I felt very connected as we were discussing originally the show, that idea that it's not necessarily current in terms of work that was made during COVID as a sort of like umbrella over our time, let's say. Um, at the same time that uh, sort of... Um, I don't know, life that takes place vicariously, I think is an, probably a very unifying element because just as Nathan was discussing the moments of where, while you're by yourself, placing yourself in a, on a picture plane anywhere in the space and still sort of referencing that sort of solitude or again, living vicariously through kind of uh, the touch that you draw rather than experience. To some extent, I think I am very much um, thinking about that at all times that I make work that sort of, again, uh, to repeat that same word, vicarious living through the image. And again, the, the, my disconnection from the narrative comes from the fact that maybe it matters to me as I draw that sort of one thing follows the other, but I feel that moment of benevolent as a, benevolence as a creator, when I step back, when the image is done, I'm not necessarily as uh, thorough or as connected to the narrative and trying to relay it to somebody um, else. But I feel like it, it's very true what you said, the comfort, discomfort, it's again in the eye of the beholder, because sometimes as a maker, um, you make things that make you uncomfortable. So you can create that ex either experience or I mean experience as far as you know, you create a scene because the work is uh, figurative, et cetera. But at the same time, I think um, your reaction to the textures that you create or your reaction to the colors uh, that you pick and you might 
pick things that actually upset you. Uh, not very simple. Yeah, and I think to some extent, uh, this work is yes, being disjointed. I think there's a lot of technical reasons why that happened, but I think the technical limitations led to some interesting discoveries for me at least that again, um, because this is a lithograph and it, it's offset uh, lithograph. So it was photo uh, plates and we printed them in different colors on different papers. And um, it's maybe the inks were the same, but the papers were so different. So the ink was very differently um. appeared on those plates. So there's a lot of like unnecessary physical steps that were taken simply I think because I was trying to maybe through labor uh, mask the scene itself only to maybe make it much more of a apparent thing and such. Because um, it, it is such a strong work to have in, in the area that we have it. I mean, it certainly does hold its own, um, but it, it encourages you to come up and look close and there's so many things to see and there's so many different layers because the processes that are in there but then you you know you realize that it is different papers it is you know this puzzle piece sort of thing all um all combined together and you know it it pushes us against what our normal expectations are of how things should be like how artwork should exist you know not at right angles not perfect here not one single piece um you know curved lines versus straight edges um it's um i don't know it just it, it was something that i thought worked really well um but it i, I think is also you know a, a piece that fits very well within your ove. <laughs> no i think to some extent uh, as well that it's the um, irregular shape of it also it kind of like speaks to the fact that it is a two-dimensional thing. And I, I think exactly to what uh, Nathan was speaking earlier that now when we watch films or we interact with, you know, visual um, information of any kind from before, let's say two years ago even, we suddenly are uh, aware of maskless people hugging, touching, etc. So I think to some extent the same here that you don't you don't have to necessarily enter the image but you can also um you know enter with some kind of like pre uh, predisposed ideas um to it but yeah anyway i i just, I just thought it was I kind of so many things that you and nathan spoke about really resonate again you reiterating that the works are uh, especially the, this one is uh, older but i feel like so many elements um touch back to the idea of uh, how is it possible? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I accidentally moved forward once, but in comparison, like I think this one might be one of your most recent prints or print series that are in the exhibition, it's still 2019. Mm -hmm. um, um, but the way this is set up for those of you who have not seen it, it's a, a portfolio. So there are nine individual prints. It, it doesn't, it's not one print with nine little uh, rectangles on it. Um, so these are individual prints that are um, on the wall in this order. Um, but yeah, it, it's a def definite step away from, I would say, like some of the uh, very dense layering and activity and line work and, and all of the busyness that are in some of your etchings, because these are lithographs. And like, how, how did your, or did your process change moving from etching to doing lithography? Because they are two very different processes. Had you, I don't know, did, did this feel different for you, like in your approach or? Yeah, I, I, no, absolutely. I think it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of an amazing um, uh, observation because uh, not only that these are um, sort of portraits, if, uh, to be literal at the same time uh, because the, it's still a stylus that whether it's a crayon or a pencil at the same time the ability to create sort of a very generous swath of uh, tone in one go allows for certain looseness to appear and um, as 
I, I definitely love, for example, for me personally, etching is something that is so important, but at the same time, that precision that I love in etching with, let's say, hard ground was my favorite at one, one, on one hand. Here, while using stylus, the stylus was not doing the same thing that I needed that. And I think it again, my own, it's not limitations of anything having to do with the materials or the medium. I realize it's my own limitations as the maker that I kind of seek certain results, etc. So I think here it was definitely a very curious experience. I worked on the stone before, but at the same time here, um, these were all very unique small stones that were ground uh, or prepared in advance. So each time the stone had a lot to contribute in terms of you know, marks that were accidentally made on the edges and I tried to scuff up the edges sort of to create a frame within a frame. And to some extent, again, going back to Nathan's images, I loved him, uh, his uh, images with putting, again, frames within the frames, not only sort of referencing photography, but also referencing maybe as isolation. But again, I think it's in the eye of the beholder as well, whatever that reference is. Um, uh, so here, I think to some extent, the same, that ability to obviously traverse different uh, tonalities and depths of uh, field that you can create. But also, I think that notion that you can really use your hands in a way like to create smudges and the fact that your hands carry oils that deposit marks, they do similar in etching. So I feel like here the material itself was dictating that sort of much more of a, uh, I don't know, kind of close-up experience rather than um, the etchings that somehow I tend to create a distance that, or maybe it's that sort of like proverbial thing that once you have an etching needle in your hands, you want to make hair. You want to make tiny, tiny hair on tiny, tiny creatures. <laughs> to be able to use the, the process and the materials to do something that they're yeah. um, like almost built for, or, or it feels like they're built for, like how do you exploit that? Yeah, exactly. And I feel like with the, uh, you know, with the cray, uh, the um, lithography, with uh, litho crayons, the smudge that allows you to create volume in one sweep, it is something that kind of like, I don't know, immediately seduces you. And I feel like that's, again, the seduction of the material um, itself. Um, yeah. Well, let's move ahead because the other prints that I have here, they're, they're etchings. Mm -hmm. um, which are, I would say, like the bulk of the, the types of pieces that I, I had really keened to. Um, I think this one is also a very early print, 2004. Um, but here I think we, we see more of the, the figurative work that's in here, but again, we can't really place like where we begin. It's not a story necessarily, like a specific story that you're telling, and we have to place ourselves in a certain location and follow through, unless I'm wrong. I'm no, no, I'm, oh, you're absolutely right. And I feel like to some extent, um, it's uh, again, that moment of where, um, you know, as the image maybe unfolds for me in the process, it uh, has sort of elements where you start and where you continue and where you end. But I think that sort of circular moment of, um, depends where any pair of eyes enters and exits is really up to them. And at the same time, it uh, can also be seen as sort of like once you squint, you see this abstract shapes and you can sort of circumnavigate the whole thing, you know, neatly through that as well, where these are vignettes rather than a cohesive statement uh, to some extent. But yeah, I think also um, obviously introduction of um, uh, aquatint and tone allows for that maybe more to happen in both directions because you know creating the ground then they all kind of sit in the same I don't know pool of you know primordial soup but at the same time one can just see it as a kind of like again abstract sheets wow. of uh, tone. Sure um, and, and Dasha we do have a, a question that has come through about your subject matter and that it seems to be a, a dream like unconscious narrative there and I from what I've read and certainly from other conversations that unconscious flowing of it does seem to be much part of your process 
Um, mm -hmm. Does it come from your imagination or outside sources, like influenced by art historical references or mm -hmm. where? I, I, I mean, it, uh, I think it, it's sort of both. I don't think it's necessarily, I, I, I used to think of it as, or I used to phrase it also as something as unconscious, but I think there is really uh, not as much of unconscious as more of like that frivolity of what if, and you know, whatever follows next. But I think in terms of art historical uh, quotes or references, it's uh, an absolutely spot on uh, the way I kind of um, created that framework uh, for myself that I don't necessarily have the reference before me or I, I, I work from, um, um, from imagination, I guess for the lack of a better uh, term, but at the same time, I think the amount of things we see and all that sort of layering that happens in our brains of all the information that ever passes through before us and, and sort of like gets registered. To some extent, it's very possible and uh, pleasurable to, you know, scoop it out from your own memory. So a lot of times the uh, distortions to the, let's say quotes from uh, art history are due to the fact that this is how I remember it <laughs> versus to me sort of uh, consciously, uh, you know, altering the pose. And, and of course, yeah. So no, I, was gonna say I was thinking we had talked mm -hmm. about this over the summer when you were at CCP with the framework of kind of the, um, like an altar piece sort of device. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily referencing a specific thing, but that the, the concept of it as a whole, like kind of carries through in our like unconscious for lack of a more specific mm -hmm. place. Um, like it, it just becomes a part of our knowledge base of, of shapes and yeah. things to carry through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, that, that, I think that's much better phrased. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. No, no, but, but that's precisely it. I feel like to some extent that uh, uh, it, it's like a retelling of a joke to some extent. You heard it, you remember the things that struck you and then you retell it. Uh, uh, and some things you remember better than others. But I think also the magic, amazing thing about prints often, especially if you're quoting something, if you quote it directly dealing with the plate and not considering the uh, flip that happens once you print, then also it suddenly the mirror image alters the uh, memory as well. So there's a lot of that happening inadvertently and sometimes consciously or unconscious, uh, not unconsciously, but sort of without um, consideration for the result. Yeah, I, I, can, I, I can understand that. I, I was just thinking of how our faces, I mean, we take it for granted that they must be symmetrical, um, but realistically, like we have asymmetric features on our faces. And if, if we were to, like you see yourselves uh, or yourself in a photo or somewhere else, like it may not look quite right because we're not accustomed to seeing that and if you're referencing something and then it prints in the reverse um th there is that much more of a distancing from it um you know some difference some uh translation like difference in the translation over time like playing whisper down the lane sort of thing yeah. if it changes but i think also to some extent uh again Nathan, quoting Nathan, I think the way uh, you were describing Nathan, uh, that idea of um, seeing something or like especially the uh, when we were young image with uh, we're obviously looking as an audience look over looking over the shoulder of uh, a figure and then there is a photograph and then there is the pot two people in the photograph and then there is a cup and the window so there's so many layers but that idea of uh, something becoming um, on one hand abstract and recognizable and at the same time that ability to pull in and out depending how if you squint your eyes or if you kind of like see the negative positive space I think that also can happen with uh, like with the memory as well that sort of ability to kind of trigger the shape but not the details within the shape and I think also again going back to that specific image in Nathan's the eloquence in Nathan's lines ability to sort of like traverse between you know in, in one single carve 
between fine um, line that kind of widens and goes back to fine. And that's one zeroing in that abstraction that happens. And then again, you pull out and you see the whole image at once again, and then zeroing in at such. I think to some extent that is something that I'm personally very interested in as well. So when I draw this sort of non sequiturs one after the other, to some extent, I am um, obviously pulling out and uh, looking at the whole composition. But once I delve back in, I realize that I need to really resolve one single uh, figure or shape at a time uh, before I can actually, you know, kind of pull out again and yeah, deal with it as a composition, perhaps. Because I mean, for all of the figures and all of the activity that's going on in your prints, like there, there is a really beautiful composition to it all. Um, the next print that's here is a very small one. It's only five and three quarter inches by eight inches. Um, and there is so much going on in such a small space. Um, but with these lines, like we, we watch them and we, we have them carrying our eye through from the foreground, through the midground to the background, um, looking and looking and looking. And um, the, the line work that you have really does, um, you know, give us all of these different spaces that we live in when we, when we experience the work. Um, and the, the, the density of activity um, is consistent or like it opens and closes in the right places. Like you just have this good feel as you move around it and your eye moves around the space. Um, so. I think, I think in this specific image, there is much more um, kind of intention than I think in the one prior where it's very true. It's much more dreamlike the one before. Uh, then the one, uh, yes, the same things can change. Uh, there's definitely sort of an action. There's like dinosaurs attacking and it's kind of pre-Game of Thrones film, Game of Thrones <laughs> battle in the dark type of moment. Um, so because of that, I think it's maybe the directionality and sort of the uh, intentionality is much more apparent. And therefore, I think that's why the composition maybe is a little more balanced and like without obvious darks or lights or something like this and I guess all the foul biting creates the like the meat on the bones of this um, image per se but but I do I feel like when I, I, I start the image I definitely have sort of like a, um, a mental grasp of <laughs> what's going to happen um, I think I'm, I'm I don't know why I'm feeling reluctant to necessarily uh, talk about it because I feel like I do feel embarrassed how juvenile to some extent this sort of violence on paper takes place. But I think what um, uh, Nathan was again, bringing up a very good point that sudden um, separation from people in the very, especially, you know, since we all live in, um, you know, as a, in, in a socium, that sudden kind of mandatory need to be separated from everyone in the physical space. I found that, um, I kind of, I, you know, in the, in the sense of being a chromogen, I do, I, I sit and I like pretend that these things are happening in my life, but at the same time, so COVID uh, or like um, lockdown was very much a continuation of something that's very familiar to me, that moment of, uh, um, yeah, sticking to the table. But so in some ways, I feel like in my work, I didn't see the change that took place which was very interesting, uh, perhaps, you know, in um, now that I talk about it, but I think to some extent that vicarious life uh, is something that I'm very much aware of suddenly in a new way. But like this very dense groups are really, yeah. Because there, there's a lot of density in the prints. I mean, the, this is another one, mouth is the heart of the face. Yeah. Uh, I, what, what has always caught my eye about your prints is the density of activity and, and how much there is to see. And I mean, there's no shortage of, of, of things, figures, spaces, um, plants. Sometimes there's a dinosaur. <laughs> Sometimes there's a horse. Um, and and it, it's an exercise for your brain trying to put all of these things together because they seem like they are so disparate. 
um, but you found a way to make all of these things work within within this space. And I I also really like for this one in particular. Oh no, there is the kind of framing around it. You've done kind of self framing um, with the hash marks on the on the edges. Yeah. Um, like I I come to this and I feel like I'm I'm set within a stage. But there's a you know some scenery like it's been shaped for me like it, it it has that sense of like created space not natural space and and that that frame that is there helps convey that to me so I don't have to work so hard to make it um real <laughs> yeah not like to some extent um this sort of like uh, looking out from the bushes device puts one in the position of a voyeur as well yeah that's just like a peephole depend doesn't matter how big how uh discreet that is uh, yeah i mean that, you're absolutely right you're absolutely right i mean obviously it's a very decorative device and which of which i'm very aware but i think that moment of core of Akua, and i think the next print and the one after probably support that's in the full uh that moment of like if you have a plate you must touch it everywhere. <laughs> and you do. <laughs> this is, this is the next one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, this is the, the last one I have of, of your prints from the show. But again, like over in the right corner, like, yeah, they're dinosaurs. I don't have to reconcile this space to try and make this fit into like some sort of reality. I'm, I'm okay with letting the eye travel and being confused and unsettled because no, not, nothing that's here is, is going to be some sort of reality for me. And these are like placeholders and mile markers that, that give me that space to, um, to rest in some ways. Those fantastical things um, are those things that take me away from some of the, the other subject matter that we see here that can be that can be very challenging to, to consider and try to understand. But then you say, I don't have to understand it because mm -hmm. dinosaurs don't really sit in the space with me. So, um, but we've gone through with Nathan, like each of his prints and we've gone through uh, with Joshua each of hers. Um, I wanted to give a chance for um, Dasha and Nathan if there were any other things you wanted to discuss or to bounce off of each other because I know Dasha you were you were eager to hear from Nathan and to um, you know have commentary um, talking about process and where you come from and, and Nathan um, you as going first, like didn't get a chance to do that. But also um, for those of you who are on here don't know, Nathan and Dasha do know each other. So um, we're not strangers um, to each other before tonight. And I would be curious to know, also realizing I, on a superficial level in looking at your work, think, oh, they're so different. But I think your attention to that detail and that line in each of your different mediums is very similar. And that, um, you know, that, that is certainly one thing that I think can bring the work together. Um, but is there anything else that catches your eye about each other's work? I mean, I've always, I always loved Dasha's uh, like draftsmanship in terms of the way but also the freedom I, I think there is a difference to shift like I do feel like my work is much tighter even though Dasha's is also very like maybe tight maybe not actually I don't know I, I, I I'm actually really intrigued by the looseness and the way she can just sit there and draw um you know I I don't really have that but I did also you know I was also interested in, when you said we we're so different I was like well I, I actually it was kind of like maybe because I also the the narrative aspects I mean you know Dasha talking about how they're kind of like these ideas that kind of come and, and just drawing and kind of create but for me I mean it's always been so heavy in the narrative and and even knowing that maybe they're a little more playful in terms of not really knowing it I think it's very interesting for me because um, I sometimes work like that and then I, I for some reason I mean maybe just because maybe working on a 
a, a lino block or a wood block, I'm spending so much time physically like carving into it. I just spend my time thinking about the image where with an etching, you could be a lot quicker and also with a litho. But I always, you know, even when I don't have a narrative, like I, I create the narrative after the image has been made a lot of times. But, um, but I'm also enjoying like, but I feel like because I always have to find, I always have to, for myself, have a reason that this image exists, which not isn't, is maybe just like, it's not OCD at all, but it's, I mean, the work kind of seems like, uh, but it, it, but it, 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 I have to have that. And I, and I really enjoy Dasha's like a little bit more freedom and, and whimsicalness to, to the works. Um, something that I thought we shared in terms of like that intense narrative, you know, like kind of finding out like it's, it's a lot more open-ended, I think is really interesting. I mean, I would like my work to be, I, typically, you know, I don't talk about my work as much. I mean, I talked about a lot just now, but you know, it's more open-ended in the terms of like, there's a lot of characters doing things, but um, but also I feel like my, my work is like a little more direct. So I'm enjoying seeing like, or not seeing, so I've seen a lot of Dosh's work, but hearing about just like the, the kind of like, you know, more whimsical aspects of it, the freedom she has with it. I think in, in response to that, that moment of uh, that ability to edit as you go is, exactly something that I admire so much because you're absolutely right in terms of the narrative on one hand, but also the symbolism that you have. Like, for example, you were discussing the the corners that hold the photographs inside the albums that is a reference to certain time, to certain uh, sort of like, not necessarily nostalgia, but whatever it can reference for you personally, but also whoever is looking, it sends them to a certain place. So it becomes that sort of portal. And I think I am very much, uh, um, as I make things, I am very much aware of that similar possibility of certain elements that I drop into the work becoming a portal as well. But I think, uh, just like you said, that sort of, uh, uh, sorry, I forget what word you exactly said, but I think it was very good uh, point of um, the ability to edit details that you have in your work where every line has, uh, if it's not loose, it, it's full of intent. And it's not because it's tight, it's because it's uh, uh, full of direction. Like it does, it, it has a course and it goes on that course. And I think that's exactly what I was sort of, I think, uh, trying to express earlier that ability to carve, starting with a hairline going thicker and again moving into something else that is obviously an abstract gesture, but it also delivers all that. Um, just eloquence of the, I don't know, the texture of uh, emotion uh, within. So, yeah. And I think also, especially I feel like, uh, um, for example, I, I, I appreciate so much you're saying like that looseness on one hand, in my case, but I think it comes from lack of intent on some level, but I think at the same time where you have, a, let's say a hand next to a mug, the difference, in the lines that describe both of those objects is thing that I absolutely love every time I look at your work, that ability to decipher between, you know, just the materials from which the things are potentially made. Yeah. Thank you. So I think in that sense, like Kimberly, what you were saying, the difference or similarity, it, it's true, I feel like perhaps it's so interesting to hear how you see our work sort of on the outside and how, yeah. In, like yeah, Nathan and I see each other's work and what we sort of gravitate. Well, and, and I think that's a, a difference in like the exhibition process and looking at the final work and what one sees when they're removed from the making. And um, I mean, clearly tonight you have the opportunity to, you know, explain and, and talk more about your process and like how you come to, to these which can have a lot of similarities under underlying your, your practice. Um, but for somebody walking in the door of the gallery, and if I go back to um, some of the gallery images, um, yeah, I mean, they're all different in their own ways. And it, I mean, it's part of what makes it so interesting like going through the space and seeing things that in their final form are different and and that's how we recognize artists work you know by your style by by what you present and how you do it um 
but there probably are a lot of similarities in why you do it and what's important to you and um, what sort of fine details you're striving for when you are making that um, will cut across all artists, all artists, some artists, most artists, whatever it might be. But um, you know, there are there are pieces to getting here to the gallery that, or the gallery wall anyway, that um, you know don't get seen, don't get heard from until you have this opportunity to actually hear from and talk to the artists themselves. Yeah. But I think also the title itself, the comfort discomfort, is a very interesting. Uh, juxtaposition because uh, it's again in the eye of the beholder the it's all sort of like relative to specific experience of who is looking who is making and such yeah um, and we do have another question asking um, can each of you address what role printmaking has in the whole of your artistic output yeah um, yeah, I think I think printmaking is at the core of everything I do, and that's. I mean, I went to undergrad for printmaking. I went to grad school for printmaking. I'm a master printer. I mean, I can't even get it out of my life if I wanted to, but it's one of these things where, um, yeah, I mean, I will. I'm at the point now because I make paintings and like I said, paintings and stained glass and ceramic. But I'm at the point now where I make a print and then I'll make the painting from the print. <laughs> like, like it's not I, I won't make a drawing I'll make a print so a lot of these prints that you see are now like three by five foot paintings and I use them as like the impetus is that I don't, I don't, I'm bad with language a lot of times for the painting and, and it, it reminded me of something like somebody I knew or somebody I know works worked with Jasper Johns for a long time not to ever like put our names in the same spot but um you know and he was saying that jasper johns a lot of times works in this way where he'll make an etching to then make the painting from the etching like he used that as like his first like he's like oh see how the etching looks and then from there i'll make the painting and i always love that and i i, I thought that was very interesting and then recently i'm like yeah i mean i i love the aesthetic of a good wood cut or a good lino cut and that's what i want and then when i make paintings i started making paintings honestly because people were like oh you know like if you got to make a painting if you want to make some money and I was like oh shit but now I love making paintings right like but it was one of those things where it, it the, the the painting only came for for business <laughs> that sounds horrible and that's actually not how I feel anymore I love the paintings but I love the aesthetic of a, of a lino cut so now I will make the lino cut first print it and use that to make the painting and they they sometimes they're almost identical except one is three times bigger um so that's yeah so printmaking it's it, it really does kind of rule my life in some six sad way but an amazing way yeah, yeah I, I, it's i think it's uh it, it's a, a kind of an interesting question because to some extent i share the feeling with uh nathan that it is really at the core of um of the practice, I, I I feel like I always make drawings and materials change. So to some extent, the drawings I make using um, etchings or lithography or um, you know a monotype, it's very much an extension in terms of the subject matter stays, the gestures stay. Perhaps uh, I I realize that sort of like the handwriting changes depending maybe on which tool I use. So you know, uh, uh, hard ground etching will always have a certain look for me and sort of certain language comes out from that experience. Again, because if the work doesn't have that sort of prerequisite or um, predetermined sketch or composition, but I think at the same time, uh, printmaking is in no way uh, sort of a side project. It's very much uh, sort of a very genuine need to suddenly, you know, draw on a metal plate. I think I am always curious to some extent the moment of uh, uh, the multiple then it becomes because I don't make prints necessary to in mind, you know, with the multiples necessarily, but at the same time, the democratic approach, I love so, so much that ability to kind of create the multitude um, with certain image and almost like little leaflets and uh, what if 
uh, and, uh, political statements, but at the same time, uh, yeah, I, I feel like the, yeah, it, it's just such a huge, huge part. Yeah, mean. and I, I agree with the like the democratic nature and also just yeah, I mean like I mean that's what a lot of printmakers, you know, we get into it because we're like, oh, we want to be able to share the work more and stuff like that. Um and I think it's a it's a wonderful part of me. It's actually why I love teaching printmaking because I love the idea of being able to teach to teach that. But I mean, printing itself, I hate printing. I mean it's my main it's my job. And so I love doing my job and I love printing for other people. But with my own work, I mean a lot like I have a block here that I made a year and a half ago at my house and I'm like I'll print it one day because it, it, it doesn't really like the the for me for some reason carving into a block of linoleum I, or wood I can do that for about 16 hours straight go to bed wake up and do it again for 16 hours um there's like a, such a satisfaction to it and it's like it's almost it's almost therapy for me so the printing part is where it becomes annoying because you're like, oh, now it has to be perfect. The carving, it just it's just like such a wonderful feeling. It's like, I also do ceramics. Throwing a pot is not that much fun. Trimming a pot is amazing. So it's like, it's just like different aspects of what I like to do. So, but yeah, I mean, you know, the, so the democratic part about being able to, you know, send it everywhere is great. It's also the thing I like, I don't like to print. So I'm like, addition of three, that's all I'm going to do. So all my prints are addition of three for the most part, because I'm like, any more than that, and I've lost interest in printing, you know, so. But, but, but I think Nathan also, uh, some said you're absolutely right. I feel like uh, printmaking at large, uh, it is, I mean, it's divided, like you are creating, as you print, if you are creating like a selective wiping or you're doing like, uh, I'm thinking maybe etching a la poupée or you're like being, um, I don't know, expressive through the material as you print, that's one story and it's a different maybe type of, like where you continue working and creating through that, but at the same time, if carving or, you know, however drawing becomes that sort of primary urge, then I think the interesting element comes like, hmm, I know it's great that it can be, uh, you know, additioned and become multiple, but at the same time, your act of sort of like the ta-da happens in the actual block. Uh, and it's, I think, also a curious thing. And I think to some extent, that's why there is magic and people who are this extraordinary uh, printers because they are artists who understand how things can be not only repeated but also how can it be actually translated onto paper and not just exist as that sort of sculptural like a drawing on wood or drawing on a metal plate and such so yeah yeah your thing so yeah printmaking sounds like a huge part yeah. It's it's interesting to hear that from each of you about your process, because also, Dasha, I know you're not very um, fussy, necessarily, in some cases about things. And um, it, it is it is a very separate piece of the process, the, the making, the, the drawing, the carving, like that is its own step. And you put so much effort into that and, and you're working towards some perfection in that, but then what you've done there gets translated into some other matrix. And like for like, like Chris at CCP, like he knows how that's going to, to translate. And you might think of that in the process and Nathan, I'm sure, you, well, and, and both of you, I mean, you, you know that there is that distance between the two ends. Um, and that there are things that you can do to ensure some um, finality of, of consistency between the two. Like what you put in here is what you want to see and get out the other side. Um, but yeah, like that process of carving the, those, the plates or, or wood block, like those are beautiful sculptural pieces on their own in many cases. Like I, I enjoy looking at those. I enjoy looking at you know, the plates that have been carved and the wood blocks and um, yeah, I, I, can, I can see how that that could could maybe not necessarily be the end goal to have 20 or 50 prints mm -hmm. at the end. Yeah, also I'm like such a perfectionist. I think that, you know, when I carve my block, I know exactly what it's gonna look like when it's flipped. It's because there's no mystery. I don't, I, I, I am such a perfectionist that I print the block and I'm like, yep, that's what it looks like because that's how I made it look like and that's what but I is, is that then the the problem solving for you and the 
the interest in the process is getting that perfection in that block. You know exactly what you've done and, and then you've done it. I mean, no, I mean, I mean, I, a little bit for me, it's just the, the, I'm honestly just the meditative process. And at the end, looking at the block and seeing it finished and knowing like that I did a good job for myself, <laughs> but it's, it, I mean, I don't know. I think carving, drawing an image is, is really wonderful, but carving maybe because I'm also like, I'm very, um, I'm very much in my head constantly and I, I, I you can't shut it off too much. And so when I carve, um, it's just enough. It's like driving. Like I, I can drive forever. And it's like, it's like it, you can think about stuff, but it's just enough to keep, like you have to stay focused on something. So it's like, it's like this weird thing that like, you know, it's, it's not even that it's just, yeah, I don't know when I'm carving, I know I have to do a certain line. I have to carve certain things out. I have to do this process. And then I usually actually watch movies all day too. So I just watch movies all day. And so it's like the only time where my brain gets some peace maybe. I don't know, that sounds weird, but uh, it, it, it really is. It's like a wonderful- That's, That repetitive activity is a moment when like when you, when you know what your boundaries are to work within and you yeah. repeat that motion, you don't have to think about it. And you have, you actually do get that space for your, your mind to wander and to open up to something else kind of me doing dishes, which is not the most exciting thing, but. You never know, different people, different strokes. Yeah. Uh, wait, there's a question, sorry. Is yeah. there a surprise with multiple color block printing that making that different than carving? Yeah, I mean, multiple blocks fun because you can, I mean, yeah, I started doing more multiple block recently because I just wanted to incorporate more color, started to have some fun with it. I, I do think that, that that is the, that can add, uh, a little bit of excitement to it. Um, and so, you know, I started doing with my paintings as well, like add some color to it. Um, yeah, I think like, you know, it, like I said, the, the, the multiple block adds joy to the printing part because the carving part I'm always enjoying no matter what. So I think I think adding color adds joy to the printing only because it, it just makes it like, then that's the one thing I don't know, right? Like I said, when I make these black and white, I know exactly what it's gonna be. When I do the color, recently I've been doing just a lot of blended rolls, split mountain rolls, whatever you wanna call it. And it's been making it a little more fun. It's making my, my work feel a little more fun for myself. So yeah, I think uh, multiple block. And I used to, I mean, I used to only do reduction prints. I think I spent like four or five years doing nothing but 15 to 20 color reduction prints. And it was like just this idea that labor was so important, but also just the fact that like I can make so many colors that I think the color block printing has brought that back a little bit. So. Um, well, I will ask, are there any other questions for Dasha or Nathan? We're reaching like 20 after eight. And I mean, I really appreciate everyone's time for coming and certainly um, Dasha and Nathan for being willing to to share so much with us. Um, we do have another, oh, I, we have a thank you to both printmakers. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, if there, if there aren't any other questions um, or anything else Dasha or Nathan you'd want to close with. Uh, great, thank you for everyone. Uh, coming and for your time and your interest, I uh, really appreciate it. Yeah. Yes, same thing. And it was great. Yeah, it was great um, with you, Kimberly, and you, um, Dasha, just to like, I mean, just to kind of, I know it's a big room, but a lot of hanging out, which is nice. It feels like, it feels like we get to actually, you know, be in this, be, we're not in the same room, obviously, but it is nice to see um, people who enjoy it. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for this. I think I'd, I'd mentioned to you earlier that one of the nice things about being around CCP is being able to pick up art conversations with people. Um, you know, when you're in the studios or you know somebody comes into the gallery and there's a, a body of knowledge that people bring with them and having a, a, a space, you know, even a virtual space where we can come together with a similar interest and everybody actually wants to hear about this sort of thing. Um, it might be different than you'd find in, in other places, you know, 
even in my, my own home, might be harder to talk about printmaking. So um, thank you very much for your time tonight. I'm thrilled you're in the exhibition. I appreciate having your work there. Um, for everyone else, it will be up through October 24th. And next week, we'll be having another talk like this with two of the other artists in the show, Elizabeth Jean Younts and Mark Rice. Um, so it will be at seven o'clock again, same thing on Zoom, there's an Eventbrite link. Um, so if you're interested, like definitely please, please sign up and come and love to have you and we'll do it again. <laughs> right. Well, thank you everyone and have a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome, bye. Bye bye. Bye, bye Chris. Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, Chris. So good to see you. Thank good you.